So there's more than one way to evaluate a limit to see if as we get near an input value, the outputs get near the same value on the left and on the right. The first thing we're going to do is we are always going to do the substitution theorem. If that doesn't work for us, if we run into mathematical trouble doing that and we don't get a well-defined output, then if it's a rational function, let's factor and cancel. If we have the same factor in the numerator as we do in the denominator, we might can factor and cancel and go ahead and evaluate a limit that would normally give us trouble if that factor was in the denominator. So that's the second thing we're going to try. The third thing we're going to try is maybe to rationalize it. If we have some sort of value in the denominator of a fraction that as we approach that value, we run into mathematical trouble, we'll try the well-chosen one idea to see if we can get rid of that root or get rid of some value that gives us zero in the denominator. As a last ditch effort, we'll analyze or look at the graph or the table of values to see if we can determine what the output values are going to. But we normally don't do that unless we've just really tried every other technique that we know up to that point. So we're going to have several different ways to evaluate these limits. So let's look at an example where we can use the pieces of the main limit theorem to evaluate this limit. Analytically, if we are asked to evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 of 2x to the fourth, well, we have several different pieces to the main limit theorem. One of them says constants get to pop out front. So we could pop that constant out front and just deal with our function. We have another one that says, listen, if I'm raising some function, any function, and y equals x is a function, to a power, don't forget your 2, it's still there, then all we have to do is evaluate that function first, see what this limit is doing, evaluate that limit, and then take that result, because that's the output of the function, and raise that to a power of 4. So remember, the limit at C is C, and that's what we're dealing with here. There's y equals x, and we're approaching input values of 3, which means the output values must also be 3. And that's where we are here. I have it all broken down, but constants pop out front. The limit can be applied first, and then the power, and the limit of a function x at C is C. This value is just as correct as that value. I know I've said you never, 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 never have to simplify. You don't. That is a correct value. If this were a multiple choice question, your answer would not look like that, however. It would look like this. So even though on free response you never have to simplify, and I don't want you to simplify, you do need to be able to do the algebra because you're going to get the simplified form of the answer on your multiple choice part of your test. You are to commit all of the pieces of the main limit theorem to your memory. You must be able to pull all of those nine pieces of the main limit theorem out of your brain and use them on quizzes and exams. You're not going to be given flashcards or cheat sheets at any point uh, on a quiz or an exam in this course this year. It's not necessary that you memorize the list. All you have to do is verbalize the pieces. Constants pop out front. The limit of x at c is c. Limits break up over addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. When we're dealing with some power, whether it's a root or whether it's an integer power, we can evaluate the function first and then apply the power. Those are the kinds of things that I want in your mind. You don't have to memorize the list. That's probably a mistake because then, then you're trying to cycle through a list in your brain. 
I want you to internalize the ideas of the main limit theorem. And remember the first thing that we always do is the substitution theorem. Now in your textbooks and in a lot of calculus courses, proofs play a big role. For us on the AP test, proofs do not play a big role. Theorems play a bigger role. I'm not going to put anything in your brains or demand you know anything that is not going to be on that exam. We have plenty of information to go through this year. I'm not going to put things like this in there and make them a requirement. But if you have free time and you want to, you can Google this or you can look in your textbook. So let's work through an analytic example using all the steps that we talked about to evaluate a limit analytically. The very first thing that we're going to do, and I want you to pay close attention to the notation that I use, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to use the substitution theorem. The substitution theorem says put that value everywhere there's an independent variable. Here our independent variable is t. It doesn't always have to be x. So everywhere there is a t in this rational function, I have written a 2 instead. The substitution theorem says just plug that value in and see what's going on. Well, 2 squared is 4. 3 times 2 is 6. Copy down my minus 10. In the denominator, 2 squared is 4 plus 2 minus 6. This cleans up to 0 over 0. Oops. This has no output value. This, which is something we will explore much deeper later on, is not undefined. This is called indeterminate. This is an indeterminate form of a rational expression. This does not equal 1. This does not equal 0. This could equal anything. It's indeterminate because we don't know if it's undefined or not. It could be undefined. It could equal 1. It could equal 0. It might equal 10. We don't know. So as soon as we encounter 0 over 0, and we may even see in our calculus work infinity over infinity, it's an indeterminate form, which means you can't just use the substitution theorem. So the substitution theorem in this case failed. Write that in your notes. The substitution theorem for evaluating limits failed. So now we need to continue on down that list. One of the things on that list was factor and cancel. So let's go back here and let's try that. Every time I am evaluating a limit, you see, you will see that I write the limit notation. The limit notation is important at every step along the way when evaluating limits. So let's factor the numerator. I'm going to have a t and a t as the lead terms. I need something that when I add it, I get a positive 3. When I multiply it, I get a negative 10. That's going to be a plus 5 and a minus 2. Now let's factor the denominator. Lead terms are t and t. Something that when I add it, I get a positive 1. When I multiply it, I get a negative 6. That's going to look like plus 3 minus 2. Look what happens for us here. That's brilliant. There is a common factor, top and bottom, meaning that in this fraction, that has a value of 1. Prior math teachers probably said, hey, they cancel. It has a value of 1. Anything times 1 is just that thing. And where are we having trouble? We're having trouble when t equals 2. Well, that gets rid of our trouble right there when t equals 2. Notice I'm still writing the limit notation down. I'm still evaluating this limit. All I've done so far is determine that algebraically this expression is equivalent to that expression. 
So whatever is happening to this fraction, as far as output values near 2, will be happening to this fraction, as far as output values near 2. So now we're going to do the substitution theorem again. Everywhere there is a T, I'm writing a 2, top and bottom. Notice I dropped my limit notation because this is a real number value. There are no T's, there's no independent variable there at all. The only time that I will see you or should see you drop the limit notation in front of an expression is when you don't have an independent variable there. Here, the numerator is 7, the denominator is 6. The outputs of this function at inputs near t equal 2, the outputs are near 7 sixths. If that's happening to this rational expression, it's also happening to this rational expression.